Amen. Well, welcome in the name of Jesus to Journey Community Church. Uh, those who are with us uh, face-to-face, those who are with us on the live feed, and then also those of you who are catching us a little bit later, we welcome you in the name of Jesus. Uh, it is a little bit different circumstance now with the new restrictions and music and everything, but we're still going to worship the Lord. And we're still going to find ways to do that, and we'll be growing and evolving and, uh, and really working to innovate and worship the Lord in new ways. So this isn't kind of the sum total of what we're doing, and we're listening to a lot of ideas from everybody about how to do that and how to be uh, in an attitude of worship before the Lord. Uh, but in any event, we just praise God. Uh, we're still here, and uh, we are before him in his presence. We are, uh, his people are together, and we, are, we know that he's faithful and he shows up, so we bless the name of the living God. In any event, uh, this is a special time because uh, Thanksgiving just passed, so happy Thanksgiving uh, from the Journey family to your family, uh, number one. And then also, uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent. It's the first Sunday of, a- of the Advent season. So, you know what Advent is? Uh, Advent is, uh, it's an old term, it's an ancient uh, word, and it's uh, from Latin, and it means uh, coming. So that's all it means, it just means coming. It's as if someone's on their way. Right? Someone's on their way. That's the sense of the word Advent. And of course, we know who that is. That's Jesus. And uh, so what we do every year, churches all around the world, and and we've been doing this for centuries, uh, we do time travel every single year around this time. Time travel. Uh, We go back in time uh, with people who were waiting for Jesus' first coming. Right? They're waiting for his first coming, and we join them. We go back and we look at scriptures where people were waiting for Jesus, waiting for Jesus. And that helps us. It reminds us that we are waiting for his second coming. So by remembering his first coming, it reminds us that we're waiting for his second coming. He's coming back. And he won't be like a little baby next time. It won't be so that anybody could harm him or anything like that. Jesus is coming back as the judge, and he's coming back to rescue and to save finally. Right? And everything will be accomplished, and, and the world will be made new. And that is great news. So we go back in time, and we celebrate. And that hopefully empowers us to live lives of expectancy and lives of hope, even in a topsy-turvy kind of world. In any event, though, a part of what we do as people who live in hope and we live in expectancy is we pray. And we pray together, and we pray before, to the Lord because we know he listens. And we know that prayer, it, it, it turns the world because the Lord responds to his people. And so we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together uh, this morning. And so we're going to do something else ancient. Uh, We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer this morning? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, Praise him. Yet another ancient thing we will be engaged in, and we uh, have done it now since we've uh, been regathered as a church in light of the pandemic, is we are going to recite the Apostles' Creed. And so that we do that, we kind of do that in a, in a digital way. We kind of merge the digital and the, and the physical. And so we do a fidgetal uh, kind of a thing every Sunday. And so uh, someone will be up leading us in the Apostles' Creed. But I do invite you to join us in the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, please. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
Amen. So we're in Advent season, and Jesus is coming, and what you just heard is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which a lot of you uh, recognize. It is actually probably the oldest Christmas carol that we have. It's, it uh, goes back some centuries. They've been able to trace it back uh, at, at, at least to the 8th century, and monks used to sing it, and they would sing it seven days before Christmas every year, right? And they, of course, they would be singing it a cappella. And uh, it's an ancient song, and of course, it celebrates the fact that uh, it celebrates the Lord, but it also is kind of a, it's, it's a downbeat song. You listen to the tone of it and everything, and it's, there's mourning. Um, and and it's, it's mourning because uh, Israel is not yet free. Israel is not yet the way God intended her to be. And so the refrain is rejoice, rejoice. You know, uh, uh, Emmanuel will come for you or Israel. Emmanuel's coming. And Emmanuel means God with us. And we're going to talk more about that in the word a little bit later. But in any event, we celebrate the Lord uh, in, during Advent, and we pick uh, different aspects of our faith uh, to highlight, and we do that through the lighting of Advent candles. And so uh, George is going to come up, I think George and Laura maybe are going to come up and help us to celebrate Advent, and they are going to uh, highlight the aspect of Advent that's faith, and they'll be lighting a faith candle today. Faith. The birth of Jesus foretold in Luke 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled. To the same and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we light the candle of faith. Amen. We praise the Lord. As we turn to the word this morning, uh, let's go ahead and pray and acknowledge the Lord and then ask him to guide us and to give us light and to give us faith uh, that we can uh, enact what the Lord has put in our hearts as he speaks to us. Let's pray. Living one who's good, uh, we need you uh, desperately. And we thank you that you are the one who meets our needs. You come to us, Lord, and you empower us, you refresh us, you encourage us. In a dark time especially, Lord, you are a light in the midst of darkness, and we bless your name. We thank you for Jesus' uh, first coming and for all the faithful saints who, um, who were obedient to you and who served you uh, to bring the Lord into this world, to guard him, uh, to guide him, and then ultimately to bow to him and to be obedient to him, people who are models for us uh, in faith. We ask you, Lord, as we await Jesus' second coming, that you would, Lord, give us faith and help us to be faithful to you. Pray that this word 
that we're going to uh, be exploring together this morning would serve that end. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, it is Advent, and it's a weird time to be during Advent because we got pandemic, and we got all these new restrictions that say, hey, can't sing congregationally, that kind of thing, and, uh, and we're six feet apart and doing all this weird stuff, and so it's probably about the strangest Advent you've ever had in your entire life, right? This, 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 one, this one's weird. I've, I've spent Advent season or parts of Advent in different situations and in different places. This is about the most bizarre one. This is the one. I'm sure that's true not only for us, for, for, but for other Christians, not only all around our city, but around our nation and around the world. So this is, this is a weird uh, advent right now. And uh, there is a lot of, right now, what I would call static, right? Static. Uh, you know that when, you, when, we, were, uh, when we were kids, uh, and there wasn't just like 24-hour TV all the time, there'd be times where like television would blink out, right? I knew this because I was a night owl, and I was, I was so offended by this. Right? I thought, no, yo, I, 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 I like watch the Friday night, late night movie, and surely there's another movie. There was not. Right? And all of a sudden, you, you know, this static comes on. Right? That didn't happen anymore because now there's, like, there's all kinds of things for you to watch constantly. Uh, very little of it is particularly good. Right? But you may watch it. Right, especially if you have insomnia or something like that, or you just have trouble going to sleep or whatever, uh, you may watch it. it not, very little of it's good, but you may watch it. But I feel like right now, because of our situation uh, currently in, in our world and our culture, there's lots of static, right? Lots of static, lots of noise, or lots of uh, what a lot of uh, people who are audio experts would call hiss, right? Lots of static right now. It makes it tough to hear. So static. Uh, in our culture, there's divisiveness and things like that. There's static for us as we are trying to rock and roll with these changes personally and in our households and our families with all the changes we've had to undergo. And a lot of times uh, there are new things that come into play, as we saw uh, now about two weeks ago. And there can be lots of static, right? And it's tough to, with, with that static to be able to uh, relate sometimes, to function, to think. And sometimes it can be tough to even hear the Lord to be able to tune into the Lord, to figure out what he's saying, and to be able to stay in sync with him. I know myself, I've had to wrestle with that. I've had to wrestle with that. Yeah, I'm a pastor and everything like that, but I'm like you, right? I, I wrestle with a lot of these changes and what they've meant for me, what they've meant for my family, and so they can be static, right? And it's tough for me at times to, to connect and to, and to, you know, really be in God's presence. And so I was thinking through Advent and, and this, the season we're in and how to, how to go into it as we're approaching God's word. And uh, it seems like basically what we need is we need noise, especially right now as we're limited with congregational singing. It's like, man, you just want a noise or you want a joyful noise, just some noise, just something loud, right? And you want God to be loud, right? And to get our attention and to break through the static. So our series for our Advent season, it's just called Joyful Noise, Christmas is Louder Than the Static. That's it. Joyful Noise, Christmas is Louder Than the Static. Uh, God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is louder than the static. God's word is louder than the static. God's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is louder than the static. Uh, the Advent, Jesus' first Advent, is louder than the static, which means also his second Advent his second coming is also louder than the static. And we're going to get in tune uh, with that loudness because there's so many other things that vie for our attention right now and so, much, so many things that distract us easily right now because of all the kinds of things, all the changes and, and, the, and the punches we've had to roll with that it's easy to get distracted. And so we need for God to be loud. And I think he is loud in a good way. And so we just got to tune into that. So we're going to do that today. And today we're, we're going to be talking about faith because we light the faith candle. And, but more specifically, we're going to say, speaking of uh, God being loud, we're going to talk about the fact that faith is louder than fear. The fact that faith is louder than fear. But by way of introduction, I just want to ask a question. Um, I'm going to ask this question. It's, it's pretty uh, specific. Uh, do you know a good thing when you see it? Would you say that you're a person in general who knows a good thing when you see it, that you're able to discern the goodness, the loveliness, uh, the wisdom of a certain thing when you see it. By and large, 
you can look at something and say, hey, that's good. Hey, that's wise. Hey, that's beautiful. Hey, that's wonderful. Hey, that is a, a, that is a really good product at a very expensive, inexpensive price. Do you know a good thing when you see it? Are you a person who can uh, enter into a garage sale, for instance? And, and figure out that uh, the person selling you this, you know, item for five bucks has no idea about the intrinsic worth. It's like you're on Antique Roadshow, right? And, and, and you know that this is awesome. For me, it would, it would have been comic books. Like, oh my goodness, you're going to sell me like this X-Men comic book for five bucks? Really? This is worth, this is worth gold, right? Do you know a good thing when you see it? More specifically, do you know a good promise when you hear it? Do you know a good promise when you hear it? Do you know a good promise when you hear it? O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, you could say, is a song about promises and knowing a good promise when you hear it, even when you hear a promise in the midst of despair. And actually, we're going to uh, do a call and response for, uh, for the words to the song. We, we can't sing as a congregation. But it doesn't mean we can't engage songs as a congregation. That's not, that's not how that works. So we're going to do it with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We're going we're to do two, two bits of it. So here it is. So I, I, I'll do the call part, of course. You do the response part. Pretty easy. All right? So O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Okay. At risk? Thank you. <laughs> that mourns in lonely exile here. And together, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Okay, and here's the second one. O come, O come, thou Lord of might. In ancient times didst give the law. And together, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Do you know a good promise when you see it? The song assumes that the, that the people who are singing the song do know a good promise when they see it, even in the midst of despair. Even in the midst of despair. You see that? Israel mourns in lonely exile. And even in the midst of despair, the chorus is, but still rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. It, you, you listen to something, you can feel the way it's moving you because, because of the, the, the tone, right, in, in the rest of the stanzas versus the lightness of the tone. The tone lightens up a little bit when it hits the refrain, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel, right? Because people in the midst of despair, God's people, we're, we're expected to know a good thing when we see it. We're expected to know a good promise, when we hear it, especially if that promise comes from God, that the content of that promise is, is God with us, Jesus Christ himself. And we're expected to know a good thing when we see it. Do you know a good promise when you hear it? And we're going to go back further in time, further in time, further than even the New Testament, actually. We're going to go about 750 years back in time before the birth of Jesus, and we're going to ask this question of a certain king who we're going to encounter right now. His name is Ahaz. We're going to say, does Ahaz, the king of Judah, know a good promise when he hears it? Does Ahaz, the king of Judah, and yeah, you're going to need your Bibles, does Ahaz, the king of Judah, know a good promise when he hears it? And you might look at me and say, who in the world is Ahaz? And that's a good question. Who in the world is Ahaz? Well, okay, so 750 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, was divided, right? It had been divided because of idolatry. It had been divided because of infighting. There's a whole political story there, but it was divided. Uh, there was the northern and southern kingdom. To the north, there was the kingdom of Israel. It was made up of ten tribes, okay, or ten uh, family clans, if you want to call them that, right? All right, so that was the, the northern kingdom. That was Israel. There were two tribes to the south who constituted what they called Judah, right? Two tribes constituted Judah. And then our nation was split. It was fractured. You had these different factions of people who had intermittent fighting with each other. They weren't constantly fighting, 
But you see it. You read the Old Testament, and there'd be these skirmishes that they would have, and sometimes they would escalate to a fever pitch, right? And so at this time, there was a king. His name was Ahaz. Ahaz was ruling Judah, Judah being the southern kingdom. And Ahaz was afraid. Ahaz was afraid. The nation of Syria, which in, in, the, in the passage in the Old Testament, sometimes Syria is called Aram. Aram, same thing as Syria. Syria and Aram are the same thing. So this nation of Syria, or Aram, tag-teamed with the northern kingdom, Israel. And they were going to take over the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, part of what was happening here is that with the tag team is that Assyria, Assyria, totally different nation, right, was the new big boy superpower on the block. So people were starting to form coalitions because they knew individually they could not come up against Assyria. Assyria was a brutal nation. Brutal, big, and bad, right? They, they were like a big superpower just before Babylon became a big superpower, right? Assyria was a brutal, big, bad nation. And people began to form these coalitions to be able to stand up against Assyria. That's what Aram or Syria did with the northern kingdom, and they were going to take over the southern kingdom and form this big old group that would be able to stand against Assyria. Okay? So he's afraid. Ahaz is afraid. Ahaz is afraid because he's got Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel forming a coalition, and they're coming for him. They are coming for him. They're knocking on the door. He's got another problem. Ahaz, even though he sits on the throne of King David, he is from the bloodline of King David, right? And he's on the throne of King David. Ahaz, Ahaz is an idol worshiper. He does not walk in the ways of David, which is what they say in the Old Testament, where you're a king. David's the measurement. He's, he's the metric because he's the ultimate king. Because he was godly, he was awesome. And so if you were a good king, walked in the ways of his father David. If you did not, he did not walk in the ways of his father David. Ahaz did not walk in the ways of his father David. He's an idol worshiper. And because of his idolatry, uh, because he, he drowned out the worship and drowned out the voice of the one true God, he finds himself in a situation where fear is loud. Fear is loud. And Ahaz is not used to trusting God. And when, when we're not used to trusting God, fear is loud. Right? And what Ahaz really wants to do, because he doesn't trust God, you know what he wants to do? He wants to go to Assyria. Assyria, the big superpower on the block, and basically go to them. He wants to go to Assyria for help against Syria, this coalition of Syria and Israel. That's, that's his plan. That's his plan, right? That's his plan. And God intervenes, though. He sends Isaiah, the prophet, to Ahaz and says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And God tries to drown out Ahaz's fear with perspective and promise. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7. And we're going to hit verses 1 through 9 first. 1 through 9. God tries to drown out Ahaz's fear with perspective and promises. Check it out. A Isaiah 7, verses 1 through 9. When Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, of, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. Ephraim's a nickname for Israel. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, and meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the, the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabeel 
king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So God sends, in response to this coalition between Aram and Israel that's coming to beat up on Judah and Ahaz, and in response to Ahaz's fear, he sends Isaiah the prophet. And he does this out of grace because Ahaz, like I said, he's an idol worshiper. Read up in the Old Testament of Ahaz. He's a terrible guy. He's terrible. He's awful. He's a terrible leader, right? Terrible leader. And out of grace, God sends Isaiah to appeal to him, to appeal to him and to give him perspective and promise. He's trying to drown out his fear with perspective and promise. In our passage, he's basically saying, look, don't be afraid because of Rezin, who's the king of Syria, or, 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 or Syria or Aram, and Pekah, the king of Israel. Their plan's not going to succeed. He mocks the two kings in verse 4. He calls them, uh, he, he calls them uh, smoldering stubs of firewood. Right? What it means is that that's the kind of wood that's only good for burning. It's not good for anything else. You can't build a house with it. You can't do anything with it. You can only burn it. It's good for fuel. You know, it's, it's, it's all they are. They're just guys who are they're, they're angry and they seem fierce, but they're all bark, no bite. Right? They burn and burn and burn, and so what? There's nothing to them. He also lets, he also lets uh, he has no, their days are numbered, verses 7 through 9. Number one, he says, look, what they're planning is not even going to take place. And not only that, he says this, he says, he says, look, the head of Aram, right, or Syria, is Damascus. That was the capital. He's like, and look, the head of Damascus is only resident. In other words, Damascus is only as strong as this king. And Syria is only as strong as Damascus, and this king's going to fail, so the rest of it will fail. He says the same thing about Israel, which is also a nickname for Israel, is Ephraim. He says, look, in within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. That was the capital of, of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. That's Pekah. It's like, this, that's it. It's like, these, these are paper tigers. There's nothing to these guys. Cool it. Don't be afraid. They're nothing. And he throws this in. He says, within 65 years, Ephraim, or Israel, will be too shattered to be a people. Within 65 years, Assyria, the new big boy on the block, is going to punk out Israel. And Israel will not exist anymore. It will be blotted out. Read 2 Kings chapter 17. Blotted Israel out. To this day, those ten tribes have not, they're called the ten lost tribes because they were scattered to the winds. That's how thoroughly they were destroyed. God's saying, don't, don't freak out about these people. Cool it. It's given per perspective and promise. They're going to fail. And then he throws this in to Ahaz. He makes another promise to Ahaz. He says to Ahaz, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Ahaz's days will be numbered too if he does not exercise faith, right? Does Ahaz know a good promise when he sees it, when he hears it? Does Ahaz know a good promise when he hears it? Sadly, the answer is no, he doesn't. Ahaz does not know a good promise when he hears it. Here's the rest of our passage starting at verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. He'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. 
For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Uh Uh-oh. Ahaz does not know a good promise when he hears it. Uh, God gives Ahaz a blank check. It's astonishing. Verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. Oh, boy. He's saying, ask for anything. Everything I just told you through Isaiah, okay, previously, about how don't worry about these guys. They're going to be toast anyway. They're paper tigers, all that stuff. He's saying, if you want confirmation that, that what I'm saying is true, ask for anything. Right. The highest heights or the deepest depths, ask for anything. Right. That's what it means. That's, that's the imagery is that the deepest depths, right, as low as you can go, as high as you can think. Ask for anything, and I'll give it to you, to show you that I am, I am I'm God, and I'm telling the truth. And he's got to do this for Ahaz, because remember, Ahaz is an idol worshiper. He's not, he's not familiar with God the way he should be. And God, out of grace, meets this idol worshiper and says, ask for anything. I'm going to show you that I, I'm going to do this. I, I got you. You don't have to turn to a pagan nation like Assyria for help. You don't have to go to other gods, Ahaz. You, you don't have to. I, 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 I'm contending for you. I got you, man. Ahaz tears up God's blank check. It sounds very religious when he does it, too. It's, it's really astonishing how religious we can sound while we're being ungodly. Verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord my God to the test. Now, that sounds religious, because actually in Scripture, you're told not to. God says, don't put me to the test, right? As if we come up with something in our minds and say, now, God, you want to, I, you, I need you to prove something to me. God, you've got to prove it to me. You hear people do this all the time. They'll say, if God's real, he should do thus and so. God, if you're real right now, I want 5,000 donuts. Right now. And I'll believe. Right? And we're not to put God to the test like that. But here's the trick. It, it's, he, he's being goofy because he, God himself is the one saying, hey, ask for anything. He's not putting God to the test. If, if, if he answered God and, and, and gave God, a, gave God he's told God, look, do this, and I'll believe, God himself is initiating, so he's not sinning against God. Good night. Gets it totally wrong. He tears up the blank check. He tears up the blank check. And so because of that, it is Israel's days that will be numbered. They talk about a child being born. God says, okay, fine. Fine. You won't take me off of my promise? You don't know a good promise when you see it? So I myself will give you a sign. You, we, you weren't smart enough to ask for a sign? I'll give you a sign. The virgin, some translations actually rightly say the maiden or the young girl. That's actually closer. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And you will call him Emmanuel, which means, that means God with us, right? And it says that he'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. What does all that mean? He's basically saying, look, this kid, before he's weaned, before he's weaned, and before he knows how to, before, before he has the moral sense to, to know, you know, what's right and wrong, the difference between right and wrong, right? So when he's, when he's young, very young, before he's weaned, 
right? And also, before, before he's got the capacity to know right from wrong, these two kings are going to be nothing. In other words, very quickly, it's a few years, a few years from now. That's good news. That's good news. And Assyria is going to be the one to wipe them out. The exact coalition they're forming is going to fail. They're forming it because they're trying to come up against Assyria, right? And Assyria is going to absolutely destroy them, absolutely destroy them. But here's the problem. Then God says, and God will bring on you and your people and on your house of your, uh, the house of your father, a time unlike any other since Ephraim broke away from Judah, he'll bring the king of Assyria. In other words, now because you choose Ahaz to continue to be in idolatry, you choose to tear up the blank check from the Lord. You don't know a good promise when you hear it. Assyria is coming for them, and Assyria is coming for you. Right? And Assyria does come, but not in, uh, in, in his lifetime. His son is a great guy named Hezekiah, who's a wonderful godly king for the most part. He had a few bonehead moments, but overall, godly king. Assyria comes during Hezekiah's time. And fortunately, Hezekiah is godly enough to where God turns him away. But it, but it cost them. It was costly. You see that? Ahaz does not know a good promise when he hears it. Because of his compromised heart, Ahaz is fear was louder than his faith. His fear was louder than his faith. But, but, there's somebody who's kind of Ahaz's polar opposite. Somebody who's Ahaz's polar opposite, and we meet him in a passage that we, that we, that we typically turn to during Advent. Right? And, 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 and it's, it's Joseph. Jesus' is, Jesus is dad. Not his biological dad, but his dad, the guy who raised him. Right? It's Joseph. Go to Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And this is where we're going to land it. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Part of our nativity narrative. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was ple pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because, of, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Sounds familiar. That's what Ahaz got. See that? When God had to roll up his sleeves and do it himself because Ahaz tore up his blank check, this is, the this is the sign Ahaz got. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, right here, you could say, what's Matthew doing here? Because is Matthew saying that, <laughs> that the, the Emmanuel, this sign, right, th this kid that means God with us, is Matthew saying that this, th the birth of Jesus was Ahaz's sign like 750 years ago? Well, no, that's not what he's saying. Because it, 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 it could be possible. How would Ahaz even know about, about that, right? There was a kid that was born. And, and, and most scholars, it, it seems like if you read the rest of, 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 the, of Isaiah, like the chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Isaiah, in, the, in that passage, and you figure out that Isaiah had a kid. And this kid is the Emmanuel. His name wasn't Emmanuel any more than Jesus' name was. This is actually the only time you ever see Emmanuel, Jesus being referred to as Emmanuel, and, every, every, and from there on after, he's called Jesus, right? It's not a technical name. It just designate, designates what he means in the plan of God. Isaiah had a kid, right? And it, this kid, symbolically, was God saying, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the situation, Ahaz. And here's what's going to happen. You've got a sign. 
right? And the sign was when this kid's a certain, by the time this kid's a certain age, these kings will be out of the way because Assyria's going to come knocking. It's going to wipe them out, and he's going to come knocking on your door too, right? That's it, right? That's what happened. So what is Matthew doing here as a narrator? Notice, this is Matthew as a narrator talking. This is not an angel, right? And Matthew's saying, yep, all this stuff about, about a virgin birth, this kid named Jesus, right? This weird situation where this, this young girl's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is to fulfill what happened in the Isaiah passage. And you're kind of like, how does that work? And Matthew's doing here when he says it's fulfilled prophecy. Here's what he doesn't mean. Sometimes what prophecy, fulfilled prophecy means is someone said a long time ago that X was going to happen. And then it happens. Right? That's, that's usually how we think of prophecy. Right? There's other ways, though, that prophecy works. Here, what Matthew's saying, he's not saying something like, somebody said 750 years ago this is going to happen, and now it's happening. It's actually not the point. He's saying, this is like that. Th this is like that. Some prophecies are about fulfillment. God said this thing would happen, and now it's been a really long time, and now it's happening supernaturally. Somebody knew before it would happen. There are some prophecies that work like that. There are prophecies of fulfillment that work that way. Other prophecies, though, when Matt, especially when you read Matthew's gospel, it's like this. He'll say, this thing that's happening now is like that thing. That's it. And what he's saying is, this guy, Joseph, who's in a really tricky situation, because his fiance is pregnant, and it's not his. And he, he knows that, you know, according to the law, she could die, Right? The capital punishment for adultery. It's like, I don't want that, but at the same time, yeah, I gotta figure out what to do with her. So he's gonna, like, gonna quietly put her away because this looks so terrible. But he loves her, right? He's in a tricky situation. An angel shows up and says, Whoa! Okay, time out. I know how it looks, I know how this looks, but it's not the way you think. She's pregnant through the Holy Spirit, all right? And not only that, this kid is special. You're going to call him Jesus. Jesus just means God saves, right? And you're going to call him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins, right? And what Matthew is saying is jo Joseph's situation is a lot like Ahaz's, except we know Joseph knows a good promise when he hears it. Joseph knows a good promise when he hears it. He's the opposite of Ahaz. He's the opposite of Ahaz. He knows a good promise when he hears it. How do we know that? Well, he listens to the angel. It's actually pretty simple, right? He listens to the angel, right? How do we know? Well, he marries Mary. He marries her. You know, the kid is not his son. And yet, he marries her, rather than expose her to shame. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary as his wife. Verse 24. He remained pure. Interesting. We're told in verse 25, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. He had the good sense to know, okay, it's super duper important that I not be involved sexually in this process. Right? Right? So he was like, okay, you know, I'm going to abstain until she gives birth. Whoa, you get married and you have no sex. Because an angel told you. That dude is faithful. That's godliness, right? Didn't consummate their marriage until after she gave birth to a son. He remains pure, keeps her pure. You know, he gets it. This is super important that I not be involved at this stage. They will have a, oodles of kids later, right? But he's like, yeah, no, can't do that yet, right? He knows a good promise when he hears it. He remains pure. Lastly, he names the baby Jesus. You might say, okay, so what? Normally, you would give the baby a family name, something like that. He names the baby Jesus, just like he was told. He knows a good promise when he hears it. 
He's scared. Ahaz was scared. Joseph was scared. But only for one of these people is faith louder than fear. Right? Only for one of them. And you and I, in an anxious time, in a time of anxiety and political division and sickness and all kinds of weirdness, faith has got to be louder than fear for us, too. Faith has got to be louder than fear for us, too. How? Well, we're to discern God's voice. We're to discern God's voice. Ahaz and Joseph both hear from God. Right? Both hear from God. One guy gets a blank check and tears it up. Another guy gets a command in the midst of a sticky situation and obeys. He knows it's God's voice. And you could tell Joseph is probably used to doing what God says. I'm not saying he got an angel before or something like that. I don't know that. But he's used to doing what God says. People who respond the way he responded, have you, usually they're used to doing what God says. Before faith in God gets loud, God's voice have, has to be loud in our lives. You've got to have a track record. Right? Usually we're not going to go from zero to 100. There's got to be a track record. You've got to discern God's voice, have a track record of obedience. Right? Next, just act on God's promises. Right? Act on God's promises. Ahaz tears up a blank check. God promises, and Ahaz is like, nah, not so much. And he does it sounding religious. That's scary. He sounds really religious. He's basically quoting Old Testament as he rejects God's promise. And he doesn't act on it. He tears up the blank check. Joseph, all Joseph knows is that his, his, his fiance is pregnant with the Holy Spirit and that there's going to be this, this kid named Jesus who in some way, shape, or form will save his people from, his sin, from their sins. He acts on God's promise. He's like, yep, giddy up. He acts exactly on what God says, or what the angels say, excuse me. And we have to act on God's promises if, if faith is going to be louder than fear. We actually have to do something. God's promises are seldom just given and said, oh, no matter what, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. Right? Sometimes it's true. But in a lot of instances, it requires something of us. It requires that we do something. Right? We've got to act on God's promises. Lastly, we have to sacrifice for God's promises. Ahaz's biggest problem was that if he would have said yes to God, he would have had to say no to his, all his idols and the way he was living. Because you might wonder, why would he tear a blank check? Because he liked idols. Because even though God was promising something good, he knew it, what it would cost him. You know, anytime, every yes that we have, that we, that we say, everything we say yes to is a sacrifice. Because it means that we have to say no to something else. Right? Even the littlest things. Say, saying yes to one thing means you've got to say no to something else. Right? We don't have unlimited choices. And Ahaz would not say no to idolatry. Joseph, on the other hand, said yes to the Lord. And he said, he said no to a comfortable life. He's getting involved with a young lady who's scandalous. And she hasn't done anything wrong, but it looks terrible. And he said no to a normal life when he said yes to God and when he married Mary. He said no to a normal life. And it dogged them. Because you read the Gospels and you, see, you, you read them closely and you see people bringing up weird things about Jesus. Oh, that's Mary's son. In other words, not Joseph's. Wonder what happened there. See that? Joseph said no to a normal life, but he said yes to God. If faith is going to be bigger than fear, we have to sacrifice for God's promises because often saying yes to God, embracing his promises and how awesome and awesome they are, how amazing they are, means you got to say no to something else. Right? Discern God's voice, act on God's promises, sacrifice for God's promises. This is how faith gets louder than fear. This is how faith gets louder than fear. Faith is louder than fear. 
even when we're trembling as we practice faith, even when we're only halfway as courageous as we wish we were, <laughs> even when we don't know or we're scared or we doubt, that's okay. When we act on faith, God honors that. When we tell God, God, my faith in you is louder than the fear that I have. God honors that. God moves with that. And uh, that's not only supposed to sustain the ancient saints who waited for Jesus the first time, but it's supposed to sustain us as saints as we wait for him the second time. May faith be louder than your fear. Amen? Praise the Lord. Cutler, and this is my wife Sandy. I've been at Journey for about three years. Yeah, Sandy hasn't us. been there at all yet. No, we haven't. But I've been watching online. We've been doing pretty well during this COVID time, missing everybody. I don't really want to be indoors for an extended period of time. I'm in the vulnerable category. We both are. But what we've been doing is uh, a lot of spring cleaning and uh, going to church online. God's been uh, working in my life by introducing me to Sandy and trying to keep up with Christian friends that I have. Some of you know I'm part of a group called Nomads, and we do a lot of Zoom meetings. There's been, it's been difficult trying to keep up with people, especially family, and, and especially with the COVID, trying to wear a mask and do all the right things. Do you want to say anything? Okay. <laughs> Working in my life, but of course bring Roy into my life, and I think during the first part of our relationship, we survived COVID by our being together, and it also helped me connect to other people. Uh, I found that there was a really important connection, finding other people rather than trying to go places and do things and spend time on unimportant things. It brought importance into my life, family, and friends. I'm Roy Cutler. This is my wife, Sandy, and we're still here. Friends, would you rise to be blessed? Because God is good, and because Jesus is coming, and because he is our Emmanuel who is present in the power of the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed, you and your whole household. May faith be larger than fear. May you discern God's voice, know it, and be empowered to accomplish all of his pleasure in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, just a, an announcement, and uh, Michael Ortega reminded me about this uh, with World Relief. A lot of you know this is a ministry that... Uh, we have been uh, building a partnership with for the past year, and uh, they uh, help uh, detainees uh, who, are, who, are, who are in uh, in the Tacoma and Seattle area, and they get them supplies and, and provide care for them, and uh, we are, have been involved in that effort as well, and there is a drive currently for, uh, for, for SOC, is that... Good. So Christmas gifts for refugee families and immigrants in our area. And uh, we'll be getting the word out via Journey Weekly. And some of you have seen, I think, some things about it uh, previously, but we're we'll getting the word out there, doing a drive. And we got about a week, I believe it is, uh, so a short window in which to, to be able to bless some families. And so please be looking on Journey Weekly for info about that with World Relief and how we can get involved in that. Is that good? All right. And if you have any questions, Mike Ortega, raise your hand so people can know who you are. Yeah, so talk to him, be distanced, but talk to him, and so he'll give you more information. 
Also, uh, after they, you guys have probably seen it at the door that we're going to be doing some prayer time uh, afterwards, and so you have probably gotten information on that as well, and so there'll be some rooms that are available for us to go in to pray if you're interested in joining us for prayer. we got some targeted prayer items that we'll be engaging in, so please stick around, okay? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. There is a, what there is is there's a list, and it tells you, hey, wh- wh- in which room people are, are, are to go to to pray for specific things. So please uh, go out front, and you can get a hold of that list. If you want to stay back and pray, that would be lovely, because we're going to call it to God and uh, keep praying, because we need him. Amen? All right. You are dismissed. Praise God. <laughs>